Hey. <laughs> I was going to see how long I could go before you guys start talking. Just figured I'd just remain silent. You guys doing well? Good, good, good. Um, hey, listen, if you have your um, Bibles, uh, go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 7. I want to get you guys going in the right direction as we, um, we start out this morning. Um, as you guys are grabbing those, uh, just to tell you a little bit of context about where we are. Uh, if you're new to the church, man, it's a great place for you to be today. Um, if you were here last week, you know that we're continuing the conversation uh, around this idea of liturgy. Uh, if you weren't with us last week, it's okay. You're not going to miss anything. But if you want to go back and listen to the messages, they're either on our website or our app. Um, but last week, we talked about the, the first part of the conversation of liturgy, uh, which is really just the idea of order. It's a fancy church word for saying order. And we talked about uh, not just the order of what we do when we come together, but there's also an order of your life, of your days, of your hours, the things that you put inside of your days. You are letting everybody else know this is a priority to you. So the main idea, the big takeaway from last week was that your liturgy, the order of your days, the order of of your years, the order of your life actually displays priority. Um, just by a quick show of hands, anybody here last week? Anybody here? You either came to the 815, the Thursday online, uh, you checked it out at some point in time. Uh, just curious, because um, sometimes, you know, we, we filter through these conversations and I don't want to be repetitive. So um, anyway, go back and check that out. And then uh, this week, uh, I want to talk about something that we're really founded on, and it's going to be coming out of uh, Mark chapter 7. But I want to give you a little bit of context um, before we get in there. Everything that we do inside the church, not just because we're a church, but because we follow Jesus, is around this particular book. Everything that we do as a staff, uh, everything that we do as individuals, because we're following Jesus, is founded inside of this book. Everything that we try to think about, all the decisions, the guiding posts, the things in which we are as a family coming together, the purpose why we wake up, the purpose we go to work, the why we have the marriage we do, why we have the life that we do, all comes from this particular book. So when you think about that, this, um, this word, this book, the Bible, is, um, is, is pretty important to us. Like it's everything that we do. We, as you, as you saw and maybe heard last week, everything that we do when we come together as a family is ordered by what we look at and what we do here. Uh, whenever we get up in the morning, we recognize that we get our life from this book. We get our direction from this book. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's just a good reminder to recognize that I was dead without the very life and the words, come on somebody, and the breath that God gave me. I figured I'd get a better response, but maybe I'll just project that truth later on. Sometimes it's a good reminder just to get open the book and realize that I am attached to and I am from a different world. Anybody just need a break every once in a while? Anybody need a vacation? I was like, you just need to get plucked out of the world that is inundating you, the one that's exhausting you, and you just, you just need to go get inundated with another environment. Come on, anybody? There's like three people that need a vacation. Now listen, honestly, the rest of you that didn't raise your hand, I want to talk with you because you have figured out something that is amazing. For the rest of us, the three other people that are in here, sometimes we just need to get out of our reality and into another reality. That's exactly what this book does. God says, listen, you're a citizen of heaven. Yes, you're here down on earth in this very, very different world. It thinks differently than you. It operates differently from you. But what I want you to do is open up this word, get into my reality, the kingdom of God. You get that deep inside of you so that you can realize you are a citizen of heaven. And so whenever we talk about this Bible, a lot of times we steer towards one aspect of it. We, we move towards... Um, reading the Bible, and we get our church together, and we get Christians together, and we say, hey, if you're not reading the Bible, you really, really should. And, and, then, and then we go after um, the point of reading the Bible, and we, we look at the facts of the Bible, and that it's uh, 66 books written over thousands of different years, and it's like 40 authors put it together. And, and, and then we go uh, under the archaeological finds of the Bible, and it, it's so valid, and, and we talk about the inerrancy, and we talk about the facts and the findings of the Bible and why it makes it so unique. And even um, a recent study that I was doing uh, just a, like a week or so ago talks about the importance of getting into the Word. And it talked about the very reason why you should get into the Word is because all these, it was almost like, um, it was almost like a baseball stat. Because it's like, 
It's like this stat and this fact and this idea and this. And, and those are all good. Don't get me wrong. Those are all massively beneficial. But when I, when I got done reading all the facts about the Bible, it didn't once provoke me to get into the Word. It's the difference between looking at a great masterpiece and sitting down in front of the artwork and talking about the chemical balances between the canvases and the, and the reactions to the paint colors and the scientific method beside why they chose the framework and an 8 by 12 and not a 9 by 13. And like th- this doesn't stoke me to be an artist at all. And I think sometimes th- there's, there's reasons for us to get into the Bible and, and really find proof inside of our mind and our heart that this book is perfect. However, there's also another conversation that I want to have that just stirs up. I just want to open the book and be awed. I want to open up the book and be massively in love with the author behind it. I want to be stirred to move into a point of desperation. I want want to open this book like I'm hungry for life because that's what God's promised. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to go in there thinking that I'm going to understand most of what's in there, but I want to open it up, reading it, so that this truth can read me, and I can be set free. So I want, I want to talk about a story inside of the Bible that, that did just that for me. It's in Mark chapter 7. I want to talk about something that maybe a lot of Scripture and a lot of the stories may not talk about a whole lot, uh, which is hunger and desperation. Have you ever been to a point in your life that you've just been hungry? Like you have not been satisfied with the status quo? Have you ever gotten to the point of absolute desperation where you just knew that you needed hope, that you needed to survive, that that you needed something that you were just not handed over? I believe that desperation and hunger is the key to opening up the Bible and getting anything out of it. And I don't know where you are, but a lot of times I find myself sick because sometimes I just don't hunger the way I should. And and the answer is not try harder. (laughs) The answer is not go to church more. The answer is not, well, if you just love Jesus more, you'd get into the word. That's not true. Listen, there is a war over your soul. And this book, not because of the black and white ink printed on page, but because the author behind it brings these words alive and active. There is a battle over you getting in this because there's a battle over you connecting with Jesus of the book. Mark chapter 7 may be an obscure story of where we're going today, but it really struck me months ago and I wanted to share it. Verse 24, I don't know if I told you that. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. It's going to be up on the screen. There it is. And from there, Jesus arose, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered into a house, and he didn't want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of Jesus, came and fell down at Jesus' feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her. And Jesus replied to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Verse 28, but the woman answered regarding her daughter, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Jesus replied, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Quick story, small one, maybe obscure. This woman comes up into a house where Jesus wants to hide for a little bit and begs Jesus, please heal my daughter. And Jesus' reply is the children, the priority, the Israelites, the chosen ones, they need the bread. We, we don't give bread to anybody else. And then she replies, yes, but even under the table, the dogs can eat of the crumbs 
And he said, because of your faith, because of what we don't want to talk about today, because of the desperation, because of the hunger, you may go your way. Your daughter is clean. She didn't work for it. She wasn't qualified. She was a Gentile. It was, it, it was, it was out of the rank of God's chosen people. However, God's grace, come on somebody, I don't know if you need this this morning, but God's grace is sufficient for our weakness. I, I want to draw a, an observation here in verse 27 and 28. Here's the conversation at its head. Verse 27, it says, Jesus replied to the woman, let the children be fed first because it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She answered, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the, uh, the crumbs under the table. Jesus, in this conversation, bears a parallel that is actually found all throughout Scripture in John chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 3 and a lot of other places, which is the Word of God is bread. The Word of God is your food. So Jesus makes this parallel through the conversation with this Syrophoenician lady saying, hey, listen, I want to let you know something, that what you're asking for is food for your soul. What you're asking for are the very promises of God. What you're asking for is the mercy of God. What you're asking for is the grace of God. What you're asking for are things from heaven that are just not necessarily deserving of you. Have you ever been there? You, you beg Jesus, I need an answer. I need an answer to prayer. I need a promise. I need you to move. I need you to give me some clarity. I need you to speak to me. Come on, somebody. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Anything, God, I'm going to search. I'm going to beg. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to ask other people. I need you to show up. Desperate things start to happen when you get hungry. And when you think nothing else in this world satisfied, but I need to get into something that actually has substance to it. So she comes to Jesus and said, please heal my daughter. It's a legitimate request. I've seen healing from you before. And he says something pronounced. He says, the bread that you're looking for, the promises of God, the very truth to unlock your soul, those are reserved for the chosen people. And, he, and she says something that I believe is, that is right along with our identity today. The crumbs fall underneath the table. What if I just eat those? Jesus is like, even my crumbs will do. Even my crumbs will do. Have you ever had a really, like really good meal? It's a really, really good meal. And had leftovers. And, and sometimes be more I don't know if you've been, you've been this before, but I think it's an adult thing. You've been more excited about the leftovers. Come on, somebody. Now, as a kid, leftovers were disgusting to me. You know what I'm saying? You're like, there's no way we're going to take yesterday's food, put it in the refrigerator, bring it out, warm it up, and serve it to me? I, maybe this is just my arrogance, probably. But as a kid, I was thinking, that's disgusting and wrong. You know what I mean? But as an adult, I'm thinking, oh, man, it's amazing. We've had so many people come and give us uh, meals now that we're, like, soup deprived. And we have three kids. We're running around this, this world pretty chaotic. For the past few weeks, we've had people give us meals. They've been amazing. They've been so good. But what I'm more excited about is waking up the next day and be like, we get that meal again. We have leftovers again. Jesus says the very things that are pure, which are my word, that come straight from heaven, you can eat on for the rest of your life. But here's the benefit. While you're here on earth, you're only going to get leftovers. Come on, you catching this? While you're here on earth, I, I can't explain it, but it's just, it's the fact that we live in a broken world. The fact that sin is here. Yes, there's little glimpses of heaven. Yes, there's glimpses of truth. Yes, there's glimmers of grace and mercy and God's presence and little trickles of heaven coming down right here on earth. But the only thing you're going to get, you're not going to get saturated. You're not going to get inundated. You're not going to be fully healed until you get to heaven. But while you're here under the table, so to speak, while you're here on earth, you can know. You can pick up crumbs. You can pick up crumbs and you can eat off of them. And even the crumbs from heaven, even the crumbs from the Bible, even the crumbs are going to be nourishing. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this idea down. This woman 
and, and hopefully our life, are satisfied by crumbs. Satisfied by crumbs. You ever thought about that before? You walk away from a meal. I am satisfied by grazing all day. I'm satisfied by snacking. I'm satisfied by just merely eating crumbs. But when the crumbs are as high a quality that heaven is, you can realize, yes, my soul will be filled with some very crumbs of God. Let me just tell you what crumbs are. Crumbs are every word inside of this book is inspired and given to us by God. They're breathed out, amen? But every once in a while you read through this and not everything is being, being breathed on. You know what I mean? They're, they just remain words on, on paper. They just remain historical accounts. They remain stories and songs. But every once in a while you'll read through the inspired word of God and something will pop pop out that you've never read before. Come on, anybody happen to this? You're thinking, oh man, wait, 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 who put that in there? I've never read that before. Well, that's crazy. I never thought about that, but that's, that's your crumb. That's your crumb. Pick it up. Journal about it. Eat it. What God's word says, meditate on it. Chew on it. Just think about it all day. Just that's your crumb. And you will be satisfied by crumbs. The things that you find in the Bible uh, that, that you go through, sometimes desperation and hunger will unlock the very things of the Word. Because you're hungry, come on somebody, the hungry people find things that nobody else does. Nobody else was looking at the bottom of the table for the crumbs. Nobody was willing to get on their hands and knees. Nobody else was willing to be humbled to go under to get heaven's crumbs. But this Syrophoenician lady said, yes, absolutely. Uh, my daughter needs to be healed. If we can't have the bread, the full-blown promises, if we're not a priority, put us 10th in line. Totally fine by me. As long as you recognize my prayers, you can have some crumbs. Crumbs heal you. You recognize that? They heal us. That's what the Word of God does. It brings us alive. But hungry people see things that nobody else sees. You know, you, you read through the Bible, maybe with a friend or somebody else, and you gather together and you think, I've never seen that before. Why, why, did, why did you get that and I, and I saw something else? Because hunger sees things that nobody else sees. Hunger gathers things that nobody else gathers and others just miss them. Because desperate, this Syrophoenician lady was desperate and she needed something from God and she found it. And she was satisfied. You know, there's this truth that, that resides poignantly in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul talks about it being a, a thorn in his flesh. And he asks Jesus about it and he says this, My grace is sufficient for your weakness. And then if you take that particular truth, it's actually found all throughout the Bible because there, there's, there's this idea that I want you to get. If you're writing notes, I want you to write this down. You access grace through truth. Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. Amen? John chapter 1. He came in the fullness of grace and truth. But, but listen to this. You access God's grace. You, you know what grace is. His promises his presence, his goodness, everything that God has to offer, he gives it to us by his grace. Salvation is by grace alone. You with me? Faith, it's by grace alone. You're, you, do you know that you have gifts? Even the gifts that you have are by God's, come on somebody, God's grace. So listen to this. You access the grace, all the things that Jesus has to offer. You access grace through truth through truth. That means one of the primary reasons why we get into the Word, this is going to sound contradictory, but so does the gospel, so I'm going to stand to it. One of the primary reasons why you and I get into the Word is to show us our depravity. You get into the law and you realize, <laughs> I, can't, I, I, I can't measure up to that. That, that's, not who, that's not who I am. God's calling you to, to, to this particular commandment. He calls you to this law. He calls you to this standard. And, and, and you're like, well, I don't, I don't measure up to that standard. And God says, you're right, you don't. But that's what I require. And the moment that the word, the law, shows you your depravity, shows you the gap in between you and Jesus, right after that, it declares that there's a rescuer. 
It declares that there's a gap filler. It declares that there's one that is perfect. Come on, somebody. It says, you know, you're never going to measure up, but I want you to honor one another. I want you to love one another. I want you to be perfect. I want you to, I want you to do this. And, you, and the more and more you read the Bible, you're thinking, I can't live up to that. It says don't murder, but even murder means hate. Don't commit adultery, but even adultery means lust. Why? Well, I, I haven't done any of those. God says you're right, but you can't access my presence, my promises. Come on, somebody. My grace until you admit you, are you catching this? Until you admit that's true about you. The Bible actually shows you who you are. It shows you your depravity, so it shows you the access of grace. It shows you the depth of God's presence through the fact that you don't measure up, but there's a good God, a perfect one that was sent just for you, that died upon the cross, that spoke your words, that lived your life so that you can be set free. And that's the truth that will set you free. Sometimes we get into this and we just want the the feel-good parts. I just want to be motivated. I want to be encouraged. You want to be encouraged? Read this word and acknowledge that you were dead without Jesus. But because of Jesus, you were made alive in Christ and dead to sin. Isn't that what the word says? Like this is the great paradox of the word. Get into this. You're thinking, gosh, this is very depressing. Uh, I'm, I'm not measured up at all. There's this Syrophoenician woman that just approached Jesus. And he's like, hey, my daughter is sick. Can you, can you heal? And then, I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading a different word, but Jesus says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You just called me a dog. Jesus, the most compassionate, loving individual, like he has more compassion and love in his left toe pinky than I do in my entire life. That God just said to a woman, no, 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 that is reserved for these other people because I can't give it to dogs. When I read that, I was sort of offended. So I put myself in the story and I think, if I'm this woman coming up and asking Jesus for bread, for grace, for healing, Jesus just straight up says, it's not for you. But this woman wasn't offended Let me say it another way. She wasn't entitled. She wasn't prideful, which is a lot of times how I come to the word. She was humble. And remember, James says that God opposes the proud, come on somebody, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace. That's what this woman received, grace. Because she came, not prideful and entitled, she came knowing, yeah, that is exactly who I am. I, it wasn't my choice, but I'm not a chosen Israelite. And for the record, I'm not either. The Syrophoenician knew that she was a Gentile. I'm not in your chosen mix. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I'm not offended by you calling me a dog. But I also know who I am. And I'm going to declare the truth to you. I'm going to search the word and let the word search me because that is the truth. And the truth of who I really am, which I'm dead I have nothing to offer. I'm poor. Last time I checked, the poor in spirit are the blessed ones. Come on, somebody catching this? That's what Jesus says. The poor in spirit. You are blessed when you're poor in spirit. The Syrophoenician woman knew that. (laughs) I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I know I'm not an Israelite. I'm a Gentile. However, I am poor in spirit. I am desperate and hungry. And I'm accessing something here. It's not by my works. It's not by my, me being chosen. I'm not, I'm not the race that you have favor on. However, I will take your crumbs. Jesus says, you can have my crumbs all day, but you're going to need to gather them. You're going to need to pick them up. You're going to need to humble yourself. You're going to need to position yourself to be in a place to find the crumbs. The crumbs are not on the table, but don't worry. One day you'll be at the table. One day you'll be in heaven, and there'll be a feast before you, and it'll be in the presence of your enemies, and you'll look across eating this amazing meal, and you've been like, this is so great. But then you'll look across on somebody and be like, I don't know how you got in here. (laughs) And then they're going to look across and be like, I don't know how you made it either. And you're going to say, and that's grace. (laughs) Thank you, God that I didn't deserve to be here, but somehow I picked up your crumbs in your word because I was desperate, because I was hungry, and I was satisfied by your word. When you walk through this stuff, it's amazing 
to, to, to see this Syrophoenician woman pick up crumbs and be okay with it. You know, Proverbs 27 says that even the bitter things in your life are sweet if you're hungry. Even the, even the bitter things in your life can be satisfying. We made, um, we made cookies the other day, and, and it calls for um, vanilla extract. Have you ever tasted vanilla extract by itself? It's not exactly delicious, you know? <clears throat> but when you put it in, when you put it in a mix of, of cookies, and you add a little bit of sugar in there, and and some flour, and some, some oatmeal, and some chocolate chips. Yo, you bring it out of the oven, you say, that's really, really good. Isn't that what God does to your life? He brings the bitter things. Come on, somebody. He brings the broken things. He brings the thing of ashes, and he turns them into beauty. He puts you in the fire. He purifies it. He cooks you a little bit and says, I know this is going to get hot. This is only for a season. Don't worry, because when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're not going to stay. I'm going to walk you through that place. But when you come out, oh, it's going to be amazing. But the hungry will pick up the crumbs through the path, through the valley, and realize I have so much to feed on here. I have so much to feed on. Because there's crumbs all throughout the Word of God. Have you ever, you ever acknowledged that? You ever seen that? I remember not too long ago, a, a friend of mine said, yo, I found something the other day in the midst of reading, wait for it, I, I found something the other day in the midst of reading genealogy. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Come on. Now, I know this baffles you because like when was the last time you were reading through the Bible and, and it came to like Matthew chapter 1, and it says this dude bore to this guy, this guy had, gave birth to this person, there was like 16 in their tribe, and then it goes on, they were born to this guy, 14 generations later to this guy, and you're like, chapter 2, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, don't lie. Like, we just do it. But this dude comes, this is like months ago, I, I, I remember, he goes, I, I just, I, I really realized that if all Scripture, in 2 Timothy 3.16, if all Scripture is God breathed, man, I'm going to read all of it. And he started reading all of it. He goes, in the midst of a genealogy, I found something. And it was significant. He started chewing on it. It fed him. It was a revelation. He was like, this is so great. And he started talking about it and writing it down. I mean, it was crazy. It was like, there, there you go. There's proof that no matter where you go inside the Word of God, that you can find crumbs if you're hungry. Are you hungry? Those who have ears, let them hear. Those who have eyes, golly, let them see. Lord, I, I pray that that's true for us. I want to make a correlation because I, I love how the Old Testament and the New Testament come together as one. There's a story um, inside the Old Testament of um, the Israelites. And God had the Israelites in slavery, much like you and I, before we meet Jesus. He brings Moses, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead your freedom. He brings them out. He says, good news, my friends. Slavery is not your lifestyle anymore. We're going to the promised land. It's going to be great. It's a land that everywhere you go, you're free. There's milk. There's honey. There's vibrancy. There's life. There's self-sustaining presence for you to live the life that you're called to. So let's go. And they walk, and they follow them, and they get to the wilderness, and they get hungry, and so what do we do when, we hung, when we're hungry? We're, we're critical, and we start complaining. That is the major description of the Israelites. They grumbled and complained. So just take note. Just take note. The areas in which you are prone to be critical, that you are prone to grumble, those are the areas of your soul that you're the most sick. Just hang out with God's Word in that area. God, I, I'm, I'm prone to criticize. I'm prone to grumble around here, this area. God, that's where I want your grace to come in. I'm not hungry here. I'm critical. I'm grumbling. God, I want you to come in. Don't work at it. Don't say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight against this. My, my uh, behavior is going to change. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out a 10-week plan. Tr trash that. This is all you do. Notice the moment that it happens. Golly, I'm critical. Man, I'm grumbling. Man, I'm complaining. Boom, right there. Jesus, your grace is sufficient because this area is weakness. I ask that you would come in, break up the root, plant a new seed of truth, 
tell me the truth, and allow your grace to grow and multiply. Amen? So here's the Israelites. They're grumbling and complaining. So Jesus comes to them and says, I'm going to feed you. And, and you probably know the story. He said, I'm going to give you manna, 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 every single day, manna. But have you ever really looked at the description of what it, what it looks like whenever he says, I'm going to give you manna? Exodus 16, check it out, 16 verse 14. <clears throat> he says, um, this manna that I'm going to give you is a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Did you catch that? It's a fine, frost-like, flake-like, like a, like a thing, like a, you know what I'm saying? The Hebrew word for man is, what is it? Does that make sense? Are you catching this? How, how do you describe this? I don't know. It's, a, it's fine. Uh, it's, fl- it's a flake-like thing. Like, this is, the, this is the Bible. I didn't type this up. This is the Bible. It says a flake-like thing. You know, when was the last time the Bible had any hard time articulate. Like, they're the one that made up the language. They probably can describe everything perfectly. It's like a flick-like thing. It's like a flick, it's like fine, like a, it's like a do. It's like a, I don't know what it is. That's what we call it. What is it? It's manna. Yeah, that's it. It, re- it reminds me, whenever you look at this description right here, it, re- it reminds me of crumbs. Fine, th- f- flake-like little th- things on the, it's tiny. It's not like, I don't know if you think this is what I thought. I thought loaves of bread. Just, just fresh out of the open, sliced, boom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, thank you. You got any jam up there? You know, just. I, I, but this is what the description is: crumbs. That's all you got is crumbs. You just got crumbs. The Israelites fed off crumbs, but but God says, "I want you to go and gather it." Let me make the correlation. I want you to go and gather it. Go here, um, but then tomorrow you might go here and, and there's no crumbs. So go, so go over here. Go gather it. You go pick it up. I love the description. Read it here sometime. Exodus 16. It says that they gathered the crumbs, the manna. This is what it says. Some more, some less. Some gathered more, some gathered less. Why? Why do you think that is? Why do some people go to the Word and have a journal filled with things? Some people go and be like, I just don't understand it. Maybe because you haven't gotten to the point of desperation. Asking the Holy Spirit, God, I can't read this book just logically anymore. I need to be desperate to come alive, and I realize that I'm dead without you. Some gathered more, some gathered less. I think maybe, I'm just going to pull on something, maybe based on their hunger. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm gathering stuff up. This is from heaven, and it's crumbs. You just, just pile it in. Yes, thank you, God. And then you're looking over this person, you're like, wow, he's hungry. Like, this dude is hungry. You ever seen somebody hungry in worship? They have no regard for you. You, 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 ever, you ever find someone and talk with someone about the Word of God? It's not religious. I mean, it's like there's a desperation like, like this word says in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says these words are not just for, for the, the, the faint in heart. These words are not something that you need to realize are, are just some menial words. Matthew 4, 4 says that man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Father's mouth. In, in relevance to today, man doesn't live on bread alone, but those who gather up the crumbs found all throughout Scripture, puts them up, eats on them, because you can be satisfied by crumbs because of the quality of what's coming from heaven. Yes, may be trickled down and broken in in part right now, but you can be satisfied in what God gives you on a daily basis so that we can pray, God, give us our daily, come on somebody, God, give me our daily crumbs. I need to feast. I need to be satisfied. But I have to acknowledge the truth, and it's that I'm sick. I don't hunger like I should. I'm not desperate like the Syrophoenician woman is. You know, the only time that you're fit physically, the only time that you really don't want to eat is when you're sick. So what do people tell you to do when you're sick? Here's the gospel. Whenever you're physically sick, they say, go rest. Go rest. Go rest. You need to rest. Don't do too much. Go rest. When you realize that your soul doesn't hunger like it should, 
Jesus' message is not work harder. It's come. <laughs> come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Rest in my presence. Rest in my goodness. Rest in my word. Rest in my work, not yours. Rest in the truth that you're sick and you're dead without me, but I, I bring you alive. I just want you to come to the point where you are empty of yourself, but I want you to be filled with Jesus.